Um, myself and Dean, uh, we, we represent a firm called JHA Consulting Engineers, uh, which is a multidiscipline um, building services firm with a pretty active BIM consulting arm, actually, that Dean, Dean heads up. Uh, we've got about 90 staff based in uh, mainly in North Sydney and also an office in Brisbane. Um, and we're going to talk to you today about the topic of BIM project management. Uh, we've got the title there, uh, Retaking the BIM Lead, which is, which is Dean's idea. Um, I, I guess it's symbolic of the fact that we've, we've all been bumbling around in the dark around uh, BIM for about 10 years. And uh, I guess this is Dean's idea that we, really time we, we, someone grabbed it by the balls and actually starts to drive uh, everyone in the right direction. We all know what we're talking about, but it seems to be uh, no one's uh, coming along, going along in parallel. So we'll talk a bit about that today. Dean's actually a certified BIM project manager, um, so you, you'll be in good hands. Um, okay, so to, what we're going to talk about, first of all, a bit of a definition of what do we actually mean by BIM project management. I guess you all get the idea of what that means, but we'll, we'll put a bit of a definition around that and what, where we see that. Why do we need it? So why, why, why do we need this additional role on projects? Why are clients going to, more importantly, why are they going to pay for it? What's, what's the need there? Uh, Dean will talk in a, a bit of detail about the roles, responsibilities, uh, and processes involved in BIM project management uh, and, and how that can benefit projects. Uh, we did a bit of a, a survey as well with some of our industry connections in architecture, engineering, and construction firms. And we've got a few quotes uh, and some little bits of information there. Um, as to how people feel about this topic, whether it's a good thing, bad thing, um, where they see it, see it fitting into a, a traditional project uh, schedule. And then Dean's got some references and resources for you if you want to look up uh, in more detail um, BIM, BIM project management courses and, and, and processes. So I'm aware that we're, we're standing between you and lunch, so we'll try and keep things moving quickly. Uh, so what is BIM project management? Uh, we're talking about holistic management of the BIM process uh, throughout the project life cycle as required by the client. Uh, so the BIM project manager is, exists to correctly brief, uh, not only brief, but resource properly projects and, and manage BIM related aspects uh, correctly so that they, they can get on track. Uh, typically the, the BIM PM will act as an advisor to a traditional PM uh, on technical aspects that relate to BIM, uh, software, hardware, people, processes and so on. Uh, they may in some, some cases they may replace the traditional PM and there's obviously room for, for, for discussion around that. Um, largely there to ensure that client objectives around digital data are met and overall to set up projects correctly and manage them so that we can achieve the rest return on investment from BIM which is at the end of the day we're all here to make money uh, hopefully so uh, that, that's usually the end goal. So why do you need BIM project management? I'll hand that over to Dean, he's going to give you some <coughs> examples. Okay, why do you need BIM project management? Now, what I'm about to say and what I'm about to show you is only on some BIM projects, but I've seen it personally happen. Um, if things weren't, if there was a system not in place. Um, so I'll just go through these just briefly. Uh, we all know uh, what clients expect when they hear the word BIM. They think, okay, we turn investment. Uh, this is technology. It's going to drive all these savings. Um, and, and it does. It's true. And the proof is in the pudding. Um, this is no offense to some of the builders, but some builders expect. When they see this, they, uh, they believe a lot of the resources and the money that's put into it is just going to burn up. Um, and some project managers, what they expect, what I've experienced, is they believe this technology is going to be the solution straight away and, and there's not going to be any problems. Well, they, they say, or well, they hope so, when it goes on site. Uh, consultants, and this is probably shooting myself on the foot because I work for a consultancy, but this is true, I've seen it firsthand. Um, they, they believe it's a, it's a waste of time because they think it's more about the education involved and understand how the process actually works and what they can get out of it. Uh, once uh, some contractors, they believe, they, they go, okay, we got this model, uh, but they do not have faith in it just yet. Um, especially going on site, they go, okay, yeah, this whole technology is great, but they still believe that, you know, being on site first and, and, and doing what they do best is probably uh, overrides whatever all the effort we put into the coordination. Um, and I have seen this, um, and I kid you not, what ends up happening if there's not a system in place um, and everyone's just trying racing to get the deadlines and no one's really talking to each other and communication it becomes the Hindenburg and becomes too big to address and then you start making losses and then you still have to get the job finished. So I hope I didn't get any noses out of joint here, but this is realistically what I've seen, but it does not have to be that way. So I'll continue over. 
Okay, so you're probably all familiar with some of those feelings. I'm sure you can relate to, to at least some of them. Um, but it's not all bad. We're not here to be negative. We're obviously here. We're all here for the same reason as in that we believe that BIM offers something uh, that can be an advantage to our business. And that may be increased profits. It may be improved safety. It may be a better quality product. Hopefully, it's probably a combination of all of those things. Um, and and there's, there's, there's one key premise, I guess, that we, we tend to, to relate back to that, that why we think that's, that BIM is going to benefit us. And that is that it's a single digital uh, data-driven environment that allows that can facilitate the seamless transfer of information between project stakeholders. Uh, we've all seen this diagram, I'm sure, the, the, the BIM curve, which is typically uh, used to illustrate that point. Um, it, it's certainly uh, definitely got no scale or anything. It's, it's, a, it's a fictitious diagram. But uh, the, the sawtooth line there in red represents the traditional process of 2D drawings, printing information, transferring that, and the information that gap that exists as it goes from an architect to an engineer to a construction uh, team and so on. Uh, and then the utopian ideal of the purple line, which is just seamless transfer of information that just keeps going on up to the sky and gets everything done faster, quicker, for less safety incidents and so on. As we all know, that theoretically is possible, but it doesn't necessarily translate that it, to that in real life. Um, and why is that? Well, some of the... the the, the key, I guess the key thing here is that our industry over the last decade or so that, that's been grappling with this has managed to put in place some pretty strong barriers to, to some of these ideals. Um, the first one, I think this is the, probably the, the main one that's been holding people back, is the inequitable return on investment that exists around BIM. Uh, in the early days, the, the early adopters of BIM uh, were largely from the design professions, so no, namely architects and then consulting engineers, both in MEP and structural fields. Uh, and they were leading edge firms that wanted to take the leap and stay ahead of the curve, invest in this new technology, and it was considerable investment in, in, pro, in software, hardware, training of staff, change management, for some larger firms it could be into the millions of dollars. And what was the return on that investment? Well, it'd be great to stand here 10, year, 10 or 15 years later and say that we're all getting 30% more fees, uh, we're not competing on price anymore, we get every project we go for, but the reality is that it's not the case, there's a lot of market forces that, that dictate these things. And if anything, probably the opposite is true. We're certainly, uh, certainly all working very hard, and it's a very competitive marketplace. Uh, so if, we, if the design firms aren't getting that return on investment, who is? Well, largely the, the, the product is a, a premium product. It's an information model. It can offer savings in construction. We've certainly seen examples of that happening. It can certainly offer large savings in operation. That's probably where the industry is currently grappling with, and there, there's certainly some success stories. But if that return on investment is going to to construction teams and operational teams, then what's the incentive for the, for the guys at the start at the coal face to invest? Well, as an executive, if you present someone with that, that uh, equation, it's a good question. Is there an incentive? So that's, that's one thing that's been holding people back. Uh, as a result, we now have an industry that's very fragmented. We've got certainly a lot of firms that are on, on the BIM journey, some more than others. There's some that are fully, fully down that path. There's others that haven't even started yet. And I'd say most people are somewhere in the middle. Uh, even, our, even ourselves. We certainly do, do, do work in both camps uh, to, some, to some extent. And uh, that, that results in project teams that have a, a vast array of different competency levels. And even if you, you do get the rare occasion that you have a project uh, that is from the get-go sourcing, that it's going, to be, it's going to be a BIM project, you're sourcing BIM consultants, they're not all at the same level. Uh, they don't, they're not necessarily being controlled to produce the same level of detail and development in their models. And the end result is a model that can't necessarily be trusted and, and isn't all that coherent. So we need to do something about that. Uh, equally, client, client understanding of BIM is improving uh, significantly. Over the last decade, there's been a, a big change, but it's still not uh, all, all that way there. That. So clients are not always seeking out consultants based on, um, based on BIM competency levels. It's still largely a price-driven marketplace. Uh, and, and, and lastly, traditional project managers are probably lagging in the, in the professionals in terms of their, their understanding of, of BIM concepts. Um, they've been notoriously absent from a lot of these forums. And I'm sure there's some, some, definitely some uh, exceptions to that, um, but it would, would certainly help the industry if, if they got up to speed as well. So I guess the, the overall theme there is that the BIM project management topic that we're talking about uh, enables um, projects to unlock maximum ROI by assuring a consistent approach. Even if that approach is at a low level to start with, it's consistency that is key across the, across the team members. Dean's going to talk a bit more about some of the process involved that can, can help with that. All right, so we have an understanding. We know that there, there are benefits involved. 
Uh, we do know there are some barriers we've got to overcome. Uh, and understanding those and, and applying a system and applying uh, someone with a bit of knowledge uh, overall of the project life cycle um, is becoming more essential, um, which I'll just go through. So the type of person we're going to be looking at, uh, this is sort of a, a, an idea of what we do with the, the BIM project manager. Uh, at the moment, yeah, they sort of compile it a bit with the software. Uh, the, you need someone that's kind of like has the, uh, the software design hat on. You also have the engineering, so understanding concepts um, and relating to the, the designers as well. And this is what was mentioned before, there's a gap that's bridging um, and it's being closed between an engineer and uh, a rubber designer. Um, you also have to understand that the project, uh, the BIM project manager needs to have their contractor hat on, understand practicality, how this model is going to be applied to on-site, understand uh, the, the tradies and the subcontractors and what they're going to get out of it. Um, and finally, you also need someone who has an idea about uh, project management where they've got goal settings. It's in line also with the client's goals as well. Um, it's a big ask and it's actually a rare uh, quality to get all those together, but I think if we become aware of what's involved, more and more people are going to be gathering these skills up um, and you will find the benefits, find these types of people. Now, it is daunting. Uh, with BIM project management, there are a lot of standards. There's no real solid Australian standards in just yet, but I've got to give kudos to the UK, what they've done so far. I know some people might disagree, but I think they've actually stepped out um, and made an effort to say, listen, we're, we're going to con concrete these standards in place. There's the PAS 1192, uh, 0.2, 0.3, uh, and 0.5, and there's British standards. These allow the BIM project management to have a bit of uh, reference and sources to develop their documentation, uh, things like the EIR and also the, um, the BIM management plan. Uh, slightly different terminology, but uh, having this across gives a bit of consistency across the projects. Um, one of the other uh, documents as well is the um, BIM forum. I've, uh, level of development specifications 2015. This is sort of like busting that gray area of understanding what deliverables are, level of development uh, between dis discipline and discipline. Um, I think including that as well as a reference, the AIA was the original and it's still quite referred to as, you know, um, the, the definition of what level of development is. Uh, but I think what the BIM forum has done is fantastic. And then lastly, you've got NATSPEC, which have really good uh, information about when you come to coordination with the you know, color coding and all your kind of class detection and your know, services and um, and things like that. But these documents are creating cornerstones for us to sort of move forward so everyone has an understanding instead of giving their own flavor. Um, okay, so from these documents and from now you've got the person uh, involved, you found your guy, you've got your, uh, you've got your reference documents in place for your standards, uh, you can start to to develop a project-focused documentation. The very first one, I cannot stress how important this is, is the employee's information requirements. Basically, this is sort of like a, a brief, a return brief that you come from the client, uh, maybe you know, the end user, and sit down and go, okay, what do you want out of this, uh, out of your BIM model? Uh, what functionality do you want? Because sometimes they might want just a, just a coordination part, they might want something a lot more advanced, but without actually having that concrete down, um, you won't be able to define it. So, your idea is to find the client's wants from the project information, what models are required and for what purpose, and if there will be uh, an assessment of existing assets. Um, we don't want to be spinning our wheels for no reason if there's no reason to do it. What's, once you confirm that, that actually just feeds into the BIM management plan. Um, I act, have actually worked on projects where there was no BIM management plan. It was <coughs> no leadership and it was just a big kerfuffle and everyone was just trying to hit these deadlines because they signed these contractual agreements they've got to deliver. Um, the BIM management plan is basically that single point of truth where all stakeholders involved can refer to and agree to um, and it can, it's organic as well, it can change with the project, uh, but ideally it's there to help the team through from design phase, construction phase and even into handover as well to the end user. Uh, a little bit more detailed, the, the BIM management plan um, covers the roles and responsibilities, uh, major project milestones, agreed pr project processes for collaboration and information modelling. Agreed matrix of responsibilities across the supply chain. This is an important part of the document where I see a lot of the times I go, okay, we want this job, we want to do level of development 300, all services. And was like, oh man, we're going to develop everything to level of development 300. But the matrix goes, is, is this form, it's like, sort of like an Excel. And it says, okay, 
you might not need this because we don't really want that, but we want to develop this up to this certain point at this stage of the project. What that does is eliminates wastage of time where people are developing all these fantastic models, but they're getting thrown out. That information is being chucked away. Uh, the standard method and procedures is the stock standard stuff about you know, document. It sounds very uh, trivial, but it's actually quite important, especially when you work in a common data environment, uh, something like Akinex or Project Web or uh, Project Center, but making sure that everyone's on the same playing field. Uh, and IT solutions, so agreement on software versions, what software is being used, uh, analytical software. Uh, so when we do exchange our models and information, that it's quite seamless. Um, and these sort of things have to be agreed upon because maybe some company, like for example, we might have, you know, Archicad's IFC files, and how are you going to use that IFC file? Well, we're going to use it through Celebrity. We're going to try and put them into Navisworks Manage. But these things are supposed to be concreted down so everyone's on the same playing field. So when it comes to exchanging models, then there shouldn't be any problem. Fingers crossed. Okay, so with these projects now, uh, you're going to have these roles that are coming into play. Um, you're going to have the BIM project manager who is in line with the client. His goal is the same as the client's goal. He understands after uh, confirming the, the EIR that there's certain um, goals that have to be met um, with the project and deliverables that have to come from the BIM model from all the stakeholders. Uh, he then translates information. There's an information manager. He looks after all the digital data that goes on the CDE. Uh, and then you have breaks down into your design or construction BIM coordinators who Govern a bit of the process, so obviously you've got a design uh, coordinator who looks after the consultants, uh, the architects, and then when you get to the subbies and construction, you'll have a construction BIM coordinator who will look after that stage as well. And then eventually you'll break down into each of the companies, consultants, whether it's architectural, structural, or MEP. So I'm, I'll briefly go through these, I don't want to word for word, but again, I think I've explained the BIM manager. Uh, his job is to overlook the whole process. Now, from start and up to handover and possibly past handover as well when you go into FM. And he's that, that technical uh, assistant to the, uh, the project manager and the client as well, um, and able to translate their wants and their needs down to the team so they can deliver. Um, I've spoken about the design construction BIM coordinator as they look after the individual stages of the process um, and ensure that the information that's coming up from the model authors uh, is correct, it's uh, validated, and then it's useful. Uh, the information manager, again, looks after all that digital data. Now, sometimes the information manager role can be molded into the BIM project manager. It depends on the project. So, again, these roles really reflect the type of project you're working with. Uh, you got your model manager, which is usually the, the BIM manager at a company. He's job primarily is to make sure that what the, the rev designers are doing or what the, the BIM designers are doing uh, is adhering to the BIM management plan and then any deliverables from that as it goes up, uh, they're, they're hitting the right um, the amount of metadata that's going in there, uh, the coordination um, and sort of uh, like a, for example clean up the models before it even goes into analytical software. And then last but not least, and I reckon these are the, bit, the hardest workers are the model authors. Um, and their job is taking designs, uh, putting those designs into a BIM environment, whether it's with Revit or any other uh, BIM software, and making sure that the designs are, uh, are produced and sent off and used and are effective. So, with that being said, uh, now you understand we've got uh, the head guy, we've got the, um, the BIM project manager, you've got the, the standards. Uh, now, and you've got a team, now you've got to do an assessment. This is one of the important parts of BIM project management, understanding your team. So at the start, uh, you want to know if there are some skill gaps involved. It might be through a questionnaire or through an interview. Um, a lot of people get a bit standoffish in this, as if they're going to lose credibility. But again, the BIM project manager and the BIM project management is the end result and making sure we can actually hit that mark. So you'll have a BIM assessment, uh, basically, seeing the skill sets of the people involved who are developing these BIM models, IT assessment, the hardware and software in place, see if they can actually deliver it um, effectively through the equipment that they have, and resource assessment. Now, this is important. You will have, sometimes I go, yes, we can do it, and you'll have this one guru, and then you have five guys who are still coming up. That guy, the guru, is going to be pressured to get this job out. So understand this, and then once you identify this, 
uh, the BIM project manager can actually put workshops together if there are skill set sh uh, shortages. Um, his job is to understand the climate and fix any areas that need to be fixed. <coughs> all right, we all love workflows and processes. Uh, we hear these words a lot, um, but they are effective. Um, the idea behind this is like a roadmap because there's so much going on and so many people are trying to hit these deadlines that referring back to the BIM management plan and having these workflows and processes in place uh, helps them and guides them to what they need to do step by step to deliver uh, what they need to deliver when it comes to BIM coordination meetings or goals and deadlines and what is involved in their model. Um, so it's very important that you have like BIM validation workflows and checklists, uh, model coordination processes, clash reports, model audits, and how the BIM coordination means are going to flow. So, we've got the processes, we've got the, uh, we've got the team, we're starting to get things moving along. So now we're up to the collaboration, the transparency. One of the things I say when I sit down with the team, and then you'll have your different disciplines, I go, listen, this is not a finger pointing exercise. Uh, a lot of people go, oh no, they're going to find out all these mistakes and design flaws. It's not, it's about picking these flaws up and there's issues prior to even going on site. Um, there's been some big doozies we picked up, but we managed to fix them prior to even going on site, whether it's going to be costly. Um, so that's one of the first things I say, scheduling the BIM coordination meetings. Uh, the issue in the clash reports, I know clash reports kind of got a dump on just before, but they are effective that I've seen, but one day we'll get to the point where we'll put a formula in, we won't need them. I hope so, because they're very, um, they take up a fair bit of my time but they are effective if they are used effectively. Um, so issuing the project reports to the team prior to going to the meeting, give them time to fix up any unnecessary clashes. Um, so when you sit down, you're actually looking at the proper uh, clashes which actually affects the design. And once you go in, agree, assign who's gonna look after what, record it and distribute back to the team. Uh, it's very important that you assign and you agree. We all know we've been in the industry for a while this is a process, but having something that can be tracked, so people are like, oh, was I supposed to do that? Were you supposed to do that? Uh, it's all on the, the CDE, so everyone has access to it. Um, and I cannot stress how important it is from a BIM project management side to always update, maintain, and monitor reports. I've seen, been on projects where they've been done, it's great, everyone's agreed to it, but no one's followed up. So the whole process crumbles, there's no point. So as long as you maintain uh, and follow up on these clashes and rerun it again and make sure they're actually being fixed. Um, I, can't, I can't explain how crucial that is and how common it, it's forgotten on the process. Whew. All right. You know, okay, as well as these meetings about BIM coordination, it's a great forum to talk about with the team, to put them together with their like mindedness, to talk about the model progress, go through outstanding actions, which is what I was talking about with the reports. Uh, and if there's anything else, any technical issues they may be having, for example, maybe getting a point cloud in that the, the file's too large, they can't utilise it, so they can't, these sorts of things, they can't, you know, model existing services. Um, these sorts of things you need to highlight and fix early on. Uh, and again, there's that transparency. Um, scopes, contracts, finali finalised and reviewed against the BIM management plan. And ascertain whether additional support is required. Um, again, the BIM project manager and BIM project management itself is all about the end goal and making sure everyone is okay to move forward. Um, again, I've seen before people have actually not talked about, tried to sweep me off the carpet, and it comes up at the end and then it's too large of a problem to fix. So, I'll hand this back over. Thanks, Dean. So, simple stuff, but you know, it's making a difference on the projects where, where we're actually working in, in that role and in that space. It's bridging that gap between, I guess, the, the, the BIM teams and traditional project managers and that, that used to be a, a bit of a chasm. So, we, we did a bit of a, um, a straw poll of some of five or six contacts across the industry, say from architecture, engineering firms, um, construction firms. Uh, I think there was a few FMs in there as well. Um, and just got a few, a few opinions back. So, there's five questions. Um, the first one was, uh, if you can see that, but uh, what trends have you observed regarding the use of project BIM management roles in the, over the past two years, uh, and how, what do you think is driving this? I guess prior to that, it was probably not really a role, or it was on some projects, it's starting to, to come to fruition now. Um, one of the responses, one of the, the main themes there was uh, 
that it's becoming more and more critical. So someone's saying that the trend I've observed personally is this, uh, this specific role is getting more and more critical for the success of a project. Uh, another person is starting to appear as a role on projects, but there's still a long way to go and a lot of potential to improve the way BIM projects are being managed. Second question was, in your opinion, when do you feel is the most appropriate point in a project timeline to engage a project BIM manager and why? Well, I guess the obvious answer is as early as possible, but that's not always feasible. Um, so one response was as early as possible, ideally at the point that a project manager, architect and planner is engaged. I guess my thoughts on that is that ideally the project manager would be the BIM project manager, but there still, there still is a gap. Um, another response, ideally a project BIM manager should be involved as early, as soon as BIM project objectives have been raised. So obviously not all projects go down this way, but as soon as there's some talk about that, that's when you should be consulting a specialist and getting advice on how to structure the project, structure the team, select, select design professionals, even selecting construction teams, uh, and get that advice in there before it's, uh, it's too late to make a difference. Uh, third question was, do you feel it's critical for individuals filling a project BIM management role to have both design and on-site construction experience, and why? It's probably a bit of a utopian ideal, but uh, we asked the question. Not surprisingly, yes, I do. Site experience helps in developing drawing skills and improves the quality of documentation one puts out. Ideally, yes. However, there is a shortage of BIM professionals. This may be an unrealistic expectation. I'd probably echo that, that thought there. Uh, what are your thoughts on using a third-party independent BIM project manager versus in-house uh, BIM manager from either construct architect or consultant team? And I guess the latter is probably what's happened primarily in the past, is that one of the, one of the design professionals has probably taken a, a management role, often the architects, um, and it's, it's not necessarily the best way to go. It's been just a case of who's available. Um, I guess what we're starting to see now, and Dean does this a lot, is acting as an independent consultant. We're not, we're not doing any design on the job. He's just there to, to make sure that processes are followed. And we're definitely seeing an improvement in the projects where, where that approach is taken. Um, and yet, it's not surprising, some, a lot of the, the feedback we were getting uh, was uh, independent BIM manager would have less incentive for impartial uh, behavior. So uh, therefore, this would be a benefit to the client. Um, there are cases for both, however, uh, independent would be more appropriate where feasible on projects. There's not too many of them out there, but they do seem to make a difference. Um, last question was, what are your thoughts on the following? Having one project BIM manager from concept stage all the way through to post handover uh, and operation, or have, having multiple project BIM managers for discrete project stages, e.g. E design, construction, and FM, and pros and cons of both. I guess with the second option, you've got the ability to have specialists there, whereas the first has to be a generalist. It may not be appropriate. Um, firstly, that, yes, that is the way to go. C continuity is needed with, with one person in the role. Uh, next response was one continuous BIM manager would be ideal, assuming they have the full spectrum of capabilities. Otherwise, specialists for each discrete stage could offer some advantages. I guess there is pros and cons to both, and, and my thoughts would largely di be dictated by the abilities of the, of the individual. Uh, and also the way the project is structured, it's not always, there isn't always that continuity. Uh, so that wraps up those questions. I'll hand you back over to Dean to get some resources. Okay, so also part of getting the guys, uh, the team on board, uh, we mentioned like project managers or builders and that, there's some great, these are the great resources where you can actually, uh, there's learning uh, RICS, Royal Institute of Charles with Bayes, they actually have a course for uh, BIM project management and understanding the process. And I think it, the key thing is understanding it first before really applying it. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's assumed that it's all going to work out, and it's not necessarily always the case. So for some of these ones, you've got the CPI, which is where you get your protocols for your, your EIR. Um, these are free to download. You've got the, uh, the British standards, where you've got the PAS, so if you want to use that as your, your cornerstone of developing your BIM management plans. Uh, NatSpec, again, they've got, actually got a site that's just uh, all page that's dedicated to BIM now. Uh, they've obviously recognised in the past, but they're really re recognizing again uh, these days and updating the documents, uh, especially for the analytical part. Uh, and the BIM forum, again, I cannot stress how the document from this is helping a lot of understanding of what is actually being delivered in regards to level of development. Uh, when people have a good, uh, better understanding that, they can see, they can actually manage their projects better, go, okay, well, this is going to take a bit more time because, you know, the client's expecting this and this is what they're referring to as a document. So we kind of have a better understanding of when we're going to be delivering this. Uh, and the one I chucked in the end was the BIM Hub. Now, 
it has been mentioned before that we are a community and it's very important to understand that uh, the BIM community and the CAD community, uh, the, the, the forums that they have, the information and exchange information, this is why there hasn't been any standards so solidified just yet. There's around the world, everyone's advancing. Um, and places where you've got a forum where you can talk to someone from uh, overseas who have a similar problem and understanding and communicating and developing each other's skill sets. The BIM Hub is a place where you can actually uh, publish and look at other projects and see what's happening in the rest of the world. Because at the moment, I feel the Australian industry is very, at the moment, very uh, sort of like trying to get the, the job over the line and it's sort of stagnated a bit. If we open up our minds and communicate a lot more to what's happening in the world and see what works and what doesn't work, um, the BIM Hub's a great place to check that out. And I think finally, I don't know, it's always good to end on a quote. Someone told me this. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound a bit cheesy, but we have the capacity to translate the vision into reality. So by that I mean we do have, we have the skills, uh, we have the technology, um, we have the vision, um, but now you need someone to drive that home, or at least a system to drive the home to recognise this, uh, more, than, more so than uh, less, the, the skills that to drop in, like uh, spearing off. So having that BIM project managed there. So basically, I'm basically saying, let's retake the BIM lead uh, and, and take these, these, these talented group of people, which is mostly you people in here, um, and, and let's point it in a direction where everyone's parallel and going the same way. Uh, I guess thank you for listening. Yeah, we're, we're currently tackling something at the moment on a, on a job where they're, they're running their own races and it really it is, it's communication. So you'll have a program set out by either the builder or, or they've got their milestones. And then you have a separate one as well with say like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the BIM team and it's, it's, they're, they're running differently. So it, what we're doing at the moment, they're communicating together, we're sitting down with the designers and sitting down and see how we can create a critical path to meet these dates that they have. Um, it's basically just join the two together, but that's, it's a big wall. Um, I'm fine at the moment, I'm getting a bit of, it's restricted because they will run their race the way they've traditionally been doing it. And then again, we have that stigma of there's a traditional way of doing it, but we've got all this other way of doing it and then they expect it's all gonna be done. So it's basically getting everyone in the same room. And now what we've done is like, we used to have two meetings where you have a design meeting, right? And you'll have like a BIM coordination meeting and it's sort of like us and them, but now, we're starting to realise that, and again, that, that gap is shrinking between a rev designer and engineer that we're putting them in the same room. That the coordination, the BIM and the model and all that metadata does relate to part of design. And that cloud of fogginess is, is slowly drifting away. So we're tackling it by putting everyone in the same room and getting the programs together and integrating them together. I guess um, my thoughts on that work, it's, uh, I'd probably draw parallels to say, um, the role of ESD consultants in the industry. I don't think that should be a role that exists. I'm not super critical of what I do, but um, it, it's something that should be part of our design. Should, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, hydraulic engineers should design sustainable projects. The problem was they haven't been, and you know they're not uh, largely. Some are. There's some great exceptions, but there is a there's a gap in that. There's a role that's that appeared in the last decade to fill that gap. It's the same thing with BIM project management. It shouldn't be a role. It should be design managers and project managers that understand BIM. The vast majority don't. And until that, that gap's closed, there's a role there. Hopefully, Dean's out of a job in 10 years. But, uh. Oh, actually, I want to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> uh, anything, any other, any other questions? No, I was hungry. No worries. Thanks, guys. A lot of hungry faces. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay.